Let's get cracking. Welcome everybody to Grand Final Time. It has taken a while to get ourselves here, but it has now finally arrived. Our best of five Grand Final, and we couldn't have asked for two greater teams to face up against each other. Even then, our third place matchup was also a brilliant match. We had Alliance going up against Team Empire in that one, but the two teams will be fighting out for the lion's share of a huge prize pool coming their way. It is Navi going up against Cloud9. A full best of five was a single elimination bracket, so there is no one game advantage going any way so we get our maximum amount of Dota, at least three games coming your way this evening. Without any further ado, I also want to welcome in my co-caster for tonight for a game of classic epic proportions. It just would be appropriate that I cast with this man this evening. His name is Cinder Man, and welcome to the broadcast. Hello, one, two, three, sound check. You're here with me, man. Awesome. I hear you. Good. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, this should be, should be a really great series, so... Um, Without any further ado, let's just jump into the draft because I actually want to make a really early point about this, which is that uh, I did a little bit of homework on this match. And um, the last time these two teams met, Navi lost the series 1 2 against Cloud9. Uh, but for all three games, one thing I really want to put a lot of emphasis on is that these two teams have similar hero pools for the support players, which is going to be really interesting to have a look at because last time they met Navi banned Visage in all three games and this time they're letting it through and it's you know heroes like um, both teams like playing Rubik, Rubik on Pilot Eye, Rubik on Kuroki, Visage on Kuroki, Visage on Aoi 2000, the Chen of Aoi, the Chen of Puppy, there's so much overlap in terms of the support pools that I just can't imagine those not being really top priority picks in this particular matchup. Yeah. Well, I, I'm interested to see if they actually just let them through the first stage, because that's kind of what's happening at the moment, man. They ban out the Naga, they ban out the Ancient Apparition. You're leaving all those heroes quite free to be picked. Obviously, Pilot Eye is going to be banning out. He doesn't have first pick up the Lycan and the Ember Spirit. I was also doing my research on Dendi before the match and uh, looking at his previous heroes. And if you just look back at the recent matchup of Na'Vi and Cloud9, then it's a little bit more diverse. But before that, it was just Invoker, Ember. <laughs> that, was, yeah. that was almost the summary of what they were always searching for for him. Uh, but with first pickup, Na'Vi actually putting Batrider up at the very, very top of their list. Now, I know Malk has been swearing thick and thin throughout the office, saying that Batrider is the most OP hero in the game right now. Um, actually, I don't know if I can say that. All I know is he's saying he's completely OP. Maybe not the most OP hero in the game. Uh, but Batrider, Na'Vi flag him up pretty high too with the first pick. He's been gaining a lot of popularity over, I don't know, It's it seems like it's been a while since he actually started being a pick again. There was like a phase of one or two months where he was barely picked, and then suddenly out of nowhere he became a first pick. And I don't know exactly what happened there, because I don't recall him getting any significant buffs or anything. It's just like, the team started realizing again, okay, this hero is absolutely crazy. Um, I'm personally surprised to see it first picked in this matchup, not because it's not a good hero for Cloud9, which it definitely is. Uh, obviously, Navi are the ones first picking it, but if you want to first pick this hero, it's because also you don't want to give it away. Uh, and Cloud9 are definitely really good uh, with that hero. Bone7 plays an amazing bat rider, but I still would imagine heroes like Invoker and Visage to be higher up on the list, and it looks like Cloud9 are just going to ignore both of them altogether and get Io and Trian. This is a really unusual first phase pick. I, I got a funny feeling, man, we're going to see something just completely unusual from them anyway. Because you, you look at the lineup and you go, well, okay, we know, like, we're talking about the support combos uh, being very well known for both Cloud9 as well as Na'Vi. They overlap a lot. Uh, but, you know, you want to come into this first game of a best of five for a grand final and bring something different towards the table. So they just put Na'Vi up there and say, okay, we're going to have so much stability through Living Armor as well as the Wisp uh, and the connection between the two of them. And you go, okay, we've got so much the ability, you've got to try and pick fighters now. So it's almost like they're trying to dictate the way Na'Vi have to now draft in the later stage here with just the first two, without revealing anything, like without showing a call. Like, you pick up an Ember Spirit and teams have to draft to make sure they've got Silence or some like Doom or Direct Counter towards these heroes. But with the first two pickups from Cloud9, it's almost impossible for Na'Vi to know exactly what's going to happen. The obvious ban will probably just be the Luna because Cloud9 run that Wisp Luna all the freaking time. Uh, so they'll probably be an obvious ban, but where you go from there, like, do you try and go for straight up nukers now? Do you worry about your top lane with an aggro try attempted from Cloud9? Where do you, how do you even approach this? And do you even think about an aggro try? Because with Tree on the bottom lane, you can still get the living armor and everything that's really required towards a, like an aggro duel or even an aggro mid. 
A tiny wisp in the mid up against the Invoker with tree and protection. Hmm. I, 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 just, I, I love the way they start with the, with the picks. Yeah. I'm wondering if the Trian is necessarily a support, actually. Um, You'd run him as a core in this? He can be played offlane. It, of course, really depends on the game uh, and what heroes you're up against. But I think Cloud9, if, they, if they're completely locked already on these two heroes being supports, I think Navi are just going to punish them for it. Because this support duo, in my opinion, as far as laning goes, it's okay. But it puts a lot of pressure on the carry to be really specific. Because else this lane doesn't really have too much kill potential. Uh, so if you're fighting a try versus try with this, you really need a carrier that can pull it off. And like you say, Luna would be an option. I'm thinking Gyro for Cloud9. But if Navi ban that out, or the Morphling that they ban right now, which I'm actually not sure would have been that strong with it, but it's just generally becoming more popular in a hero that Cloud9 as well like to play. Uh, but I'm thinking if, if Cloud9 are locked in this, Navi could just pick a jungler right now and just get a better early game out of it because in my book an IO train protector plus anything almost is not really a strong enough aggressive trialing if Navi has a good defensive one. Um, even so even they if they try and run something like a CK because if you grab yourself a jungler and you got no presence up on that top lane like that would be an easy way they can kill him off. I'm, I'm also wondering too if Cloud9 are even considering an axe in this in this matchup. You want someone that can be aggressive, someone that can just harass him out as well I'm, I'm also, I'm also mm -hmm. just looking for the creep skipping approach, so then they can just dive under the tower with Wisp Tether, Tree and Protector Armor, and something like an Axe in there, giving like the bonus movement speed too. Like, that's a lot of potential for killing. I know, I, I know I'm just spitballing ideas out right now, but like, I, I don't think Cloud9's lane is really that like, passive. Like, Tree does a lot of damage for a support hero, and Wisp is just able to make it even more possible to, to dish out the deeps. Looks like Navi aren't really worried too much about the IO combos, which is, you know, this is kind of unusual when IO gets picked this early. You generally see teams banning out the classic combinations like CK, Tiny, like you said, Luna, sometimes even Gyro. Mm -hmm. uh, but Navi ban out Morphling, which doesn't really have the sickest synergy with IO, let's be honest. Um, that's not really a too good combination, but I'm wondering what Navi's approach here is, what the plan is. Because they banned out the Templar Assassin, which I think makes sense for the mid lane to secure that the Invoker, who is more than likely going mid, will not be struggling too much. But then on the other hand, you also think, why are you banning Templar Assassin when you have a Batrider, who's actually one of the really good heroes against TA in the game? What's your plan, and why does that worry you more than a Tiny or a CK? Um, and to follow up on your idea of, of um, creep skipping, or what should we call it, going between the towers. I don't think that's actually technically called creep skipping, but... Um, Is it, what, what, what's the technical term? I don't know. Going between the towers. <laughs> I've, I've always known uh, as creep skipping. That's the only reason I say it. Yeah. Um, I, I actually... I'm not completely sure what you would call it. But regardless, um, if Cloud9 were thinking about doing that, I think that's really risky to go, do against a Batrider. He's one of the best heroes at, at punishing that because... You're really far up into the lane. If Batrider TPs in, or if he somehow comes out of the jungle or whatever for Navi, you're suddenly faced with a situation where you get multiple heroes stickied up, and then Firefly is just absolutely crazy against these heroes, where you look at Cloud9 and they don't really have too much right now to, to deal with the Batrider. They're going to get Doom, um, which Navi responds to with Shadow Demon. And I'm still, you know, I feel like. Most of the time when I'm watching drafts, I have a pretty clear idea of what's going on, but I'm really not sure what the teams are thinking right now. This is a really hard one for me to just get into. You see, now Cloud9 has picked triple melee with Io. Yep. Um, who is offlaning here? Is it going to be a Doom? If Doom goes jungle, then Treant has to offlane, or they have to run an aggressive Triant. Weird one here. If, if we go with, the, with what Cloud9's been doing in the past, that actually should be Sing Sing on the Doombringer. Uh, you asked the question before why TA should be banned out. If you actually look through the history of Sing Sing, just over the past seven days or so, uh, he's played a lot of games in the last seven days, uh, but the majority of it is Marana and Templar Assassin. He's actually played five Templar Assassins, he's played seven Maranas, and then he's got two Invokers and a Doombringer. That's the extent of his pickups right now. So if you put Eternal Envy over onto that Tiny with the Whisk combination, and then you've got Tree supporting wherever he wants to go, and then you just get a last one for Bone 7. And of course they can switch it around, like Bone 7 can take the Doombringer, you can push the Tiny Wisp into the middle lane, go classic old Fnatic style, uh, and then have Tree and Protector babysitting the bottom lane and have like, a rather more aggressive offlaner. 
someone that can deal with whatever Navi's going to throw their way. Like, you, you, you can be, even pick up, I don't want to say a Timbersaw in this game, but someone else that can do well on the offlane. Mm. I really don't know here what's... I think with these with the pickups Navi have uh, have done so far, I don't think we're going to see them running any sort of, of weird aggressive laning. And you see now Cloud9 are considering, okay, Navi might just go greedy here, so we ban out the Chen. So we don't allow them to get the Chen push with the Juggernaut. And of course, Invoker, if he plays Exhort, they're going to have the, the Forge Spirits as well, which I really don't want to rule out here because I'm not sure for Navi if a Quaswex Invoker is the right approach here. I'm going to need to see the last pick for that because generally you're... You're um, distinguishing between, or you're choosing rather, between doing damage and giving control. I'm not saying Quaswex doesn't deal damage, because of course it does, but it's more of a control-oriented build with mana burning, mm -hmm. uh, whereas the Exhort build does a lot of damage. And of course, the Shadow Demon combination with Sunstrike we've seen a million times before, it makes it incredibly easy to land the Sunstrike with Disruption. Um, I also want to say that for Na'Vi, their picks are starting to make more and more sense now, because when you think of it, Shadow Demon and Juggernaut are hard heroes to gank with the IO Tiny. Uh, you're going to see the relocate coming in, you disrupt the guy they go on. Juggernaut himself can just mm -hmm. use Blade Fury and, and try to buy some time and get out. Mm -hmm. Bad Rider will more than likely have a Blink, and Invoker can Tornado. So, as far as that goes for Cloud9, it might be hard to find these pickoffs that you generally want to get with IO Tiny. Yeah. Hey, you throw all that in, you throw disruption. Yeah, you're right. Like Cloud Nine's gonna have a very rough time. So the other option is they just force it. Like you don't try and go for relocate ganks and you do it uh, the way Wisk kind of turned into once like he lost his stun on the tether. And you just use it to force out towers. But that kind of means they need a little bit more push than what they've got. Like they need a lot more push than what they've got. Like almost at the level of a pugna uh, coming into the lineup for that. I think you know, that would be good here, actually. But if, if you're going to do that, then you've got to force an aggro trial lane from Cloud9. Like, put the Pugna up against the Invoker, leave the Doom on the bottom, and then run Tiny, Wisp, and Tree, all three up on the top lane. Because you're still going to have... Just go ultra greedy Cloud9 style with a trial lane, easy lane, and a jungling Doom. Yep. <laughs> it yeah. is possible. I don't know. Hmm. And, They're and taking their time here. Did they want that puck? I think they did. Hmm. They're going to get Queen of Pain as the alternative solution here. This is just a, you know, it's a really strange lineup here from, from Cloud9, I feel. Navi, in my book, a lot more usual draft, a lot more classic combinations of heroes, but I'm really curious to see what Cloud9's plan is here, because I guess now when you look over, they're going to probably run an aggressive trolley now, I would assume, when they pick Queen of Pain. Um, and do you really want to run into this trolley of Navi? Well, with a, with a Witch Doctor, I think it's manageable. Like, if, if it was someone which was more like Latrak Lena, then I'd be a lot more concerned, because just the amount of burst damage and direct control you'd have. But with someone like a Witch Doctor, this kind of feels a little bit more defensive in nature, as far as the lane goes. Like, they'll just out-heal them. So, yeah, I, I, would, I would almost want to push the Quop to the bottom lane in this, and just try and do a semi-dodge against the tri lane. Because you know disruption and cask is going to cause you problems. If you're going to blink away hero, you should be able to get yourself away to safety with living armor to back you up. This, this yeah, is true. This, it's going to be really interesting it's to see if, if the Navi lane can actually gain control or if it's just passive control. I think you're right. I think Cloud9 could just offlane the Queen of Pain. I think that was your point, right? Yeah. I didn't miss it, it, yeah, Either okay. offlane or safe lane, because I don't know if Navi yeah. want to even attempt an aggro try with Witch Doctor and Shadow Demon. Because that's just a lot of pulling or smoke ganking if they really want to make that lane pay off. It's true. I think, yeah, we, we could be seeing that. It is at least Bone 7 picking up the Queen of Pain, and he's going to start with a magic stick. So, no, actually, they will be running the aggressive trial lane by the looks of it here. Oh. I'm not sure if this, is, um, if this is the right call for Cloud9. I'm not saying their lane is weak, because both Tiny and Trend Protector hit hard, and, you yep. know, you have, the, you have the stun as well as the slow, uh, with Leech Seed level 1 being skilled here by Aoi already. Yeah, so they he's definitely always going to do that, man. They, they, they don't care about leaving armor in this top lane. Like you, you talk about the ability just to spin and get yourself away, but if that's down, or if you get a support hero like a Witch Doctor, and you get Leech Seed out, and then a quick tether in by Pile I Die, and then an Avalanche, it's got some good range on it, you just toss the Wisp in so you know you're going to get your double slow out in whatever hero you're chasing. I think the killing potential is, and the ability to dive under the towers has still got killing potential is really high. And if Funnick does go up there and uses his Firefly, he has to back off while that's down. Because he doesn't have his ability just to run out of the map. I believe even then that got nerfed recently. So you, you can't do yeah. what Batriders used to be able to do. So it's a lot more... It's, the killing potential is a lot higher. You've still got to battle with the trees. 
Like, Funnet can just Firefly into that, so you may not have a clear path like what you normally search for. But the potential is really there for killing for C9. And they block the pull point. I've got a funny feeling they just want to go in. In fact, I think this is one of those games where not blocking the pull point would be better for them, because if a pull comes, they have even more license to kill on that top lane. I think it's really interesting to see the way uh, the way the lanes are shaping up right now because I think Navi were actually planning, uh, or I was expecting Navi to just run the safe lane trial lane. Um, but it's hard to tell what they are expecting of each other because there's a lot of mind games going on with where do you think the enemy team is laning, so you're going to try to trick them. And I, I think in some way the teams kind of tricked each other, so I don't know who's going to end up favoring. Who this is going to end up favoring? I think the bottom lane, the fact that Bone Seven gets uh, oh, a Queen you? of Pain versus Jugger lane, should be easy enough. Yeah, Kuro is just messing with Sing here. Th this is real problematic too, because that was Sing Sing's thirty-second camp, which he needed, because he gave up the middle lane to get that creep too. So the momentum now is all the way of Denny. Like he's already two for three in this middle lane, and he has the creep wave up on his high ground. Sing Sing sacrificed so much to try and find that thirty-second creep. Well, and he's going to be playing <laughs> against a, an Exhort Invoker with Doom. That's a really tough lane already, in my opinion. Invoker, when he gets a few levels up, is going to do so much damage. Of course, you have Cold Snap, and Doom has zero armor. So if he doesn't get the Stout Shield procs he needs, he's going to take so incredibly much damage from Dendi here. And like you said, Dendi has the, the creeps on his hill here, and he's just going to keep controlling the lane here in Sing Sing. Can't really... That's one of the problems of mid lane Doom. He really doesn't have many ways of messing with the equilibrium here. So Dendi's going to have one of the easiest lanes I think he's had in a long time in this game. Yeah. The, the upside, though, for Sing Sing is the fact that this top lane is being so defensive. And well, then again, once Aoi hits his level 2, then it's going to be OK, because then Living Armor will come the way of Doombringer. And with both Scorched Earth as well as uh, Living Armor, Sing Sing should remain alive. He's going to wait it out, use his Devour, get the bonus money, and just survive that way. Uh, then the trade-off I'm looking for, which is going to be probably more important for me, is Bone 7 here on the bottom lane. Like, Horvost is going full out aggressiveness to push him back, because he knows he's got boots, he knows he's got the movement speed over on Bone 7, so all he's got to do is just stick with him, try and force out the blink, and then Bone 7 has to hold back for 20 seconds. There's just no other choice for him on this lane. And he knows too that Kuro is already being an harassment, he's taken the haste rune at the 0 minute mark, and now 2 minutes in, he grabs a DD rune to cause more problems for Sing Sing is what he's going to find. He's going to find a Frost Armor Creep. Not really what he was searching for. Still, it's better than nothing. I think it's, you know, at, at the end of the day, like you said, for Sing Sing in mid, if he gets just decent farm and he can stay alive, I think oh, he's going to be happy with he's that. He's up a long way. It's a very good thing Now he's rotated in. Kuro's going to want to make a move, and now he's going to see him. Like, he can lead Seed up, but then again, Kuro's damage output is quite high, and there's nothing Sing Sing can really do to help him out. Like, if he had level dead, he's going to Scorch Earth and try and sear him up that way. And Aoi, well, the movement speed's winning here. It's 350 because of the boots up against the one, up against the 305, but a quick cask from Kuro is able to get a double hit off on that too. And it just keeps Aoi far enough away that he can't get the final hit into Kuro. Yeah, and meanwhile, in the top lane, it's Envy's just getting so much farm out of this. I would say oh, definitely. Oh, here we go. Double avalanche with the toss. Poppy's going to cop a couple of spirits to the side, but they're not staying in close enough to get the final hit. And Envy, I don't think he can get in that far, man. He was just staying with Pile Die. That was all he was really trying to do there. Are you right? Oh, now bottom. Oh, Vost is surrounded. How did that even happen? He's put the healing ward out to try and fight this, and Kuro's the. At least you'll get his stun off. The first blood goes to Owie. He manages to push Kuro out of the lane to start with, which means that Bone 7 can come in close and brings down a Vost. That was just a really awkward position I Vost ended up being in there, being surrounded by Trian and Queen of Pain. How did he even get stuck in that corner? I I only caught the tail end of it. I'm not sure exactly how, how, it's, how it started out, but... Of course, if you're playing as aggressively as Havost is on this lane, he really wants to try to pressure Bone 7, like you said. He is exposing himself to, to the possibility of these really weird ganks, <laughs> to be honest. Getting ganked by level 2 Trian is kind of unusual, but... You know, the, the opportunity was right there. Cloud9 do get the first blood, and as far as the laning stage goes, just the fact that Sing Sing, or sorry, um... That, um, Envy, wow. Brain laps. That Envy is getting so much farm here. I feel like it, it favors Cloud9 quite a lot. They're already 1500 gold ahead, which, of course, a part of it is the first blood, but if, if you discount that, it's still, if you disregard that, it's still about a thousand mm -hmm. that they're getting just from the lanes. And I think Navi will probably have to deal with this tiny up top because I don't think the way this bottom lane is going, that the trade on farm they're getting is good enough, even though Dendi is having a good time. And Singh is doing pretty well. He's, he's got 15 CS. That's more than I thought he would get right now. 
Yeah, and with the Devour, it kind of makes up for it. Like, you switch over towards the net worth, and uh, he's only behind by 100 gold. He's only behind, so the CS means nothing in the end. Funnick on the top lane, Avalanche and Toss with the Spirit Balls going on him too. He's one hit away from death, and they get it. And that's the diving straight underneath the tower. Living Armor can be given over from now if they want to heal him back up. But they've got more problems on the bottom lane. Like you get a kill over on the Batrider, which is already a great thing for, oh, for you, because he can't catch up. There's no stacks coming up in the jungle, and he only just leveled up the Firefly anyway. But uh, the T1 tower may help him out with a little bit of extra injection of cash. That's why they've committed three heroes. This is the aggro trial lane you were looking for from Na'Vi. But it's just so passive. I was actually imagining them to easy lane trial lane in this game, but I, I think what Na'Vi really wanted here was to meet the trial lane of C9. And the teams kind of ended up dodging each other because in my book, Na'Vi's lane would have been able to fight C9s. They had heroes with very low armor, um, not too tank tanky either. Both Tiny and and Treyand are deceptively weak early on, even though you look at the, the health of them, you're like, wow, they sustain a lot of damage. No, they don't. <laughs> they don't really have anything apart from health. Um, so Navi would have liked to have that. They didn't get it, and now they're going to have to go for a plan B, where I think they did a really good job here rotating and getting plan the bot B tower is as a mid. mid. Disruption, catcher, sunstripe, but in comes Owie. Leech seed on Denny. Dane's going to be really careful. He's going to cop a lot of damage there from Owie. And he protects Sing Sing to the last. Their frost armor really coming in handy. Yeah, it's it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be hard to kill Sing because of that. It kind of addresses the one weakness Doom has early in the lane. He's he's his health is absolutely crazy. I think he has like the highest strength on level six in the game, or at least one of them. He has forty two base strength right now, which is kind of crazy. So as long as he has armor to go with it, Navi's hero composition just can't really bring him down at this point without ganking with like three or more heroes. So Puppy coming in there is not gonna cut it. Puppy, who by the way is level two only. So these rotations have really cost them as far as the support levels go. Trian, in comparison, is level 3. Um, who is He's generally one of the slowest leveling supports in the game because, you know, you stand far back, you use the living armor, uh, he's been moving across the map a lot, but he's still ahead of Puppy here. And is now <laughs> jungling together with Sing. This is kind of the big brothers out clopping the centaurs together. It's <laughs> uh. kind of funny to see. <laughs> It, al it almost reminds me, reminds me of like these mid-solo Nagas, which have been coming up recently too. Like you just get one person to stack from, then they just force the Naga down, rip tight it up, and they just soak up all the experience and the money together. The way, the way to power level your mid-Naga. Yeah, but middle lane again, we're seeing prep coming in from Puppy. Problem is he has to leech out the experience here from Denny, which is going to get a little bit better now that Denny's finished up his Midas. Not as, not as early as you would have really thought when, we, when you saw like, the early advantage, which Denny was able to claim in the lane. But now he picks up the Midas just before the 8 minute mark. It's not late, but when you only have like boots and a wand, you might have expected just a little bit earlier than that. I think, I think the rotations from C9 have messed with Dendi a little bit here. He's still been getting good farm, but like you said, we would have maybe thought he would get it a little bit earlier. But Aoi has been on the ball, and Sing Sing getting the, um, the Ice Armor was really important, I think. In hindsight, that... If he would have got another creep, a more classic creep, if you will, that might have turned out worse for him. I think the defensive oh, one was really useful. Kuro. Kuro. Phone 7, he commits. Throws out the full ulti. At the same time, middle lane, there was more rotation coming in with Aoi as well as Pylite Eye. And Kuro realized just how deep he was in. Attempted the TP out, but just... At least he baits out the ulti of Quop, but Quop just gets a solo kill as well. So 3-0 and for Cloud9. It's still a zero gold game, but... Navi are ahead by a tower, so technically it's, you know, unclaimed gold on the map. If we consider that, then Cloud9 is definitely ahead. Yeah. Uh, but it's not by a huge margin. It's a thousand experience as well. What I'm more interested in is the distribution of levels among the heroes, because I think the, the problem for Navi is going to be that their supports are as low leveled as they are. Puppy being level 3 and Kuro being level 4, and the Io being level 5, almost halfway to 6 for Cloud9. These global ganks, even though we talked about Navi having pretty good counter ganks, and of course the Witch Doctor with the cask as well, he might not even be able to get it off in time. He'll yeah. get one shot by this ganking duo. Um, and Cloud9's mid game is pretty pretty scary here, I think, for Navi. And now that Dendi's playing the Exhort build, they won't have the stalling mechanism of Tornado EMP. So maybe we'll see C9 taking down some towers pretty soon with Sing Sing going for a mech build as well. For me, I think the most important thing for Navi, and this is where their strength is going to kick in is their ganking potential. If they wait for C9 to initiate on them, they're going to die. But with the Batrider now sitting at 2k gold, you get that Blink Dagger up and running. Funnick managed to finally get into the jungle and get that burst of money. Uh, are they going to kill off a Vorst? Well, he's doomed for the moment. 
But he's also got these phase trying to run out, but with a toss from Envy and the relocate in by Pylai Dai, there really is nowhere for him to go. Yeah, Sing came out of nowhere there from the fog and got the Doom Ooh, Look off, how they which... switch it too. Pilot Eye brings Bone 7 back up towards the top lane, so he's going to scream up pretty quickly, and Pilot Eye, if he gets all the balls into Puppy, he gets the kill. Kuro throws out the stun, but there's a Creep Wave here to also soak it up, and then Funic, he's going to join the top lane. But Envy returns, double avalanche, follows up on the toss into Funic, and again the Spirit Balls around, manages to actually get a double kill out while Bone 7 finishes up the Witch Doctor. And 10 minutes in, Cloud 9's at 7-0 on the board. Yeah, and they're going to take the top tier 1 tower. Uh, bottom lane, Sing Sing. I don't think Vost is going to get this kill. No, Sing's too fast. He's already committed the Odyssey strike. strike. Might be able to help him out. If a Vost can get... Oh, he can't. Living Armor. It kicks in. And with both the score Earth level 2 and Living Armor and Frost Armor, there's no way a Vost could chase it. This is this is such an, a beautiful early game performance from, from Cloud9. I think the support rotations and the general decision making has been really good so far. I mean, you can't really say anything against them when you <laughs> when you haven't given away a kill, right? Yeah. Uh, but apart from that, they've still been doing a really good job, not only with surviving, but also the whole distribution of levels, like I talked about, has really been paying off here. The IO is playing a really big role right now for Cloud9. And he got, I think, Pilot I had a level 6 at about 8 minutes or so, which is pretty early. Of course, that's what you get when you run the lanes the way Cloud9 did, but it just shows again that the way they decided to run this has been really useful. Bottom lane, Havost is going to get doomed. I think we might see a relocate Yeah, there here. it is. And Havost knows it too. He goes to the other side, but it's only Pylai die coming in with the Spirit Balls to hit him. They will get close to having enough damage to finish him off, and that's why with Scorch Earth, Pylai die. he really can't keep up with that. And now Havost, the Doom is off. Puppy disrupts up the Doombringer just to keep him away. And Havost will spin himself away to safety. Let's see, two thousand gold now. So they did get a they did get a rebuttal tower. So basically, the tower score is even at this point, which means that their lead in gold effectively is about yeah, yeah. It's what it says now: two thousand gold, three thousand experience. Actually, check it's out not... what Funic's doing too, man. Like he's hoarding. He's hoarding gold. Uh, he's gonna buy the blink now. He, so he's going to get from I think the he was shop. just clearing out the wave first. Yeah, okay. this is. I think this is the time that Navi gets a chance to come back in the game. I think, if, like you said, if they just sit back and let Cloud9 play their game, they're going to get caught off and die around the map. Oh, but funny. The Avalanche, with blink, and he's dead. Oh, he's Top lane. Use it. <laughs> no. First time the blink gets revealed is during his own death. And that was a real problem, too, because Havorce was also having a bit of a scout out looking for a kill. And they had a secondary support also in the neighborhood just before that. But that's even more critical because of this ward right here. This ward right here basically makes it impossible for Funnick to go jungle. Because he'll just get relocate ganked every time. Still, if he has a blink, he will generally be able to get away, but not if he doesn't see it coming. It's more, I think for Cloud9 right now, it's it's not so much about setting up the relocate ganks as it's just about knowing where Na'Vi are and just... Oh, puppy, we're gonna, we're gonna, gonna relocate go. coming to bottom lane and they're gonna find already the blink from Funnick. He'll evade. The first hit with the Avalanche. Puppy will die right now to the Doom. He's trying to deny himself off to the Mud Golems, but they're just too docile in the trees to come out. But at the same time, Stendi was able to get a kill off in the middle lane. Navi got a kill. Yep, they managed to finally kill off the Queen of Pain. How often do you see Navi getting their first kill at 13 minutes? It's like, I, I don't remember the last time it took them so long to get a kill. And a big part of it, I feel, is, again, the, the initial laning position where... It was hard for Navi to find the kills. Here we go, Lasso. Yep, they managed to pick up Envy straight up with a Juggernaut ulti 2 and then into the spin, which means Tani's already gone down. And that's two calls in the space of one minute. And now he, he wants to run out of here. Sing Sing's still hovering around, but he's more of just an intimidation factor now on the line. But Navi got what they wanted. This is the ganking potential they have. Funnick at least was able to get a kill with the first time he used the Blink Dagger and evades the bottom gank. Even though they lost, uh, like they lost Puppy on the bottom lane, but they lost Puppy for getting a tier one tower in the mid, claiming two cores, and now coming in for Roshan. Yeah, this is really, really good play from Navi here. They're making the most out of, you know, that was just a little victory they got, and then they turn it into a bigger one, and then an even bigger one. You know, this is just world class play where you don't just get the kill on the Queen of Pain, but you get the kill on Queen of Pain. You use the rotation to go and get another kill in mid and the tower, and then Roshan, and then suddenly. What was looking like a really good game for C9 in the beginning is now going to be dead even. And I'm just wondering now, when we get into the mid game, how much is Cloud9's strategy going to pay off when we get to the big team fights? Because we've got our oh, top lane puppies really dead. <laughs> um, 
We've got Envy playing the Tiny without a Greedy build. So he's gonna... He, he didn't go for the Midas first. He's gonna go for an Ags as his first item. But that also means he really has low attack speed. And I don't know it's, if it's, Cloud9 has the damage they need to take these mid-game fights yet. He's actually adopting the way that uh, both No-Tail and Era run the Tiny. Which is to, in fact, well, actually, he's not even doing that properly, because if he's doing that, it'd just be basic boots. Uh, nice entry one as well, watching Funnick, but Sing Sing didn't respond. He's now going to get tethered up and Pylai die. Well, he can't get Sing Sing out of this one. Kuro throws the ulti down, and the tree ulti will be able to cancel that one. Sing Sing, he's still living through this. Pylai is keeping him up and about, but Sing Sing finally. Na'Vi committed a lot of time and effort into getting that kill, as well as ability, so they got to be careful not to overextend. Puppy's too far up, and Envy's rotating in. The mana comes in, and they throw Pilot Eye into the front lines. With the scream from Bone7, they get the kill, and Dendi, the Doom, will finally wear off on him. Turns into a Cold Snap over on Pilot Eye, uh, and then blinks himself away. So good to see also Dendi going for full maneuverability invoker. I, I, I was really depressed if he was going to go into something really defensive like BKB, but happy. This is, uh, this is such, you know, this is the classic Dendi Invoker build with a Quasic Sword. We've seen this countless times where he focuses completely on the mobility because he knows that his weakness on the hero is if he gets caught out, he's pretty much dead. But as long as he can control his own position in the fight, he gets a lot of more opportunities to set up for a Tornado uh, Meteor. Mm -hmm. uh, he gets the, the opportunities to get off the crucial cold snaps to get in and use the Ice Wall as well, which both Blink and Force Staff are really good for. Uh, and it just shows Navi's strategy for the mid game here, what they're setting up for. Yep. I think this right now is going to be a really decisive fight. If Navi it's need to be wait, crucial. Though. Navi need to wait another ten seconds before Lansu is up. Just need to hold the creep wave out for now. Yeah, C9 knows this is too risky. They're going to back out. This, but this is a dangerous thing for them to do because this is okay. I, I didn't actually finish uh, talking about like No Talent Hero and the way they approach the Tiny and Wisp combination. Uh, but the way they do the greed is different. Like you, ha you can have Midas greed for Tiny. And then you go like your treads, your drums, then you get into your Yasha with your Aghanim Scepter. Uh, or you go in for the Hyper Stone to go into the AC. Like you can approach it that way. But the way they normally approach it is to actually just rush the Aghanim Scepter. And your main thing you're doing is just overcharging. Yeah. Like, and with that, Pylai Die just hurts himself. He will then like buff up Envy and then be able to regenerate Envy while he sits on the front lines. That's the normal goal of this. But the primary part of it is you bring down towers. You continuously bring down towers. Now, there's a relocate up towards top lane while they're farming up the Ancients. I don't think Envy really wanted to be here. It was just more of a security TP to make sure Bone7 was okay. Uh, but yeah, the, the way the greed works is, is through different ways. Like, they're farming up the Ancients right now. They'll move in towards the towers. But they've got to keep taking landmarks. That's what the Aghanims is for. Yeah, that, that was my point exactly. Because if, if what Cloud9 is aiming for is to just farm, I think... I think Envy could have just gone for more of a, a greedy build with the Midas. He had a great uh, opening amount of farm, and he could have delayed the Ags a bit and got something else, perhaps. Of course, it is a great farming item. It is arguably the best one for Tiny if you don't count Midas as the first choice. So in that sense, it's not that he isn't getting farm, but he's still 1,500 net worth behind Dendi, and he's playing the position one hero. Uh, in comparison, Havost, who was actually... Not even close to his CS in the beginning. It's only a thousand behind, so not really too much. And the thing about this is, if if Cloud9 are just going to be playing a farming game, I feel like they should have gone way more greedy on their builds. But they're taking the mid game approach. You can't really. I mean, they've got a mech on Doom, they've got Ags on Tiny. Queen of Pain is getting an Ags, which is pretty unusual as well. So they're looking to take the mid game fights, but. I'm just not sure if that's if that's the right approach here because I think Navi are really really strong right Provost. now. Provost. <laughs> Getting forced back right now. Even though they're strong, they still have to back up every now and then. With a hasted wish to do so. Uh, and, and maybe, like, you talk about mid-game approach. You get an Scepter on that Queen of Pain. She's going to be spamming the crap out of her ultimate. Like, just to keep up the... Just to push the creep waves back. Because that is another problem of Na'Vi. Their life points are great, but they can't keep their creep waves alive. Like, their heal Aww. is continuous with the wards. Now, Funnick is looking for an opening with the Firefly. And he had a chance for a quick moment. But the problem is, they're being forced out in the bottom lane at the same time. And it's like they don't want to go up on the top lane without Puppy either. I'm just going to trade one for one on towers here, which I think is okay for Na'Vi. The thing is, when you're playing against a Treant, when you go for a tower, you really go for it. Just poking towers down is not going to work. So they want to full commit and make sure they get it down. Because if they get it down to like one third HP, it's pretty much waste of time. It's just going to get Whoops. healed up by living armor. So. That wasn't intentional. They just used the toss, which means Lasso on Pylon Eye. Sun strikes on the way in, but the Avalanche right on top of Funnick. And then into the spin, which the Witch Doctor ultimate. 
Cora will pick up the double kill on the top lane. Of Voss and Funic doing the doing the heavy work. And it goes 11-5. They get themselves a double on the combo. <laughs> that was a little bit funny to see the Sunstrike from Dendi was completely off the mark. I think he was expecting Funic to continue pulling them. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit of miscommunication, but didn't matter. Um, Koro I coming in with a perfect timing with a cask on both heroes and getting a beautiful ultimate off as well. And I love the build from Koro. I think we see this too rarely on Witch Doctors. So Maledict is a great ability for sure. Uh, but it's just a very situational ability where, as a support, you don't generally want to commit yourself that heavily into the fight because the cast range of this ability is really short and the area as well. So it's very restricted to getting used in certain scenarios and you will rarely hit more than one hero, basically. Wasn't it so he's gonna increased during the last patch, though? Like, it, it was, it was made a little bit, bit easier during yeah. the last one. But it's still, it's still a very hard ability to land, and it has to be, because it's absolutely crazy. Like, the damage output from that ability is completely sick, so it has to have some weaknesses to, to be a balanced ability. But, again, with the game plan, I love seeing the level 4 Voodoo re Restoration, because Navi are just focusing on this kind of teamfight-oriented play, where this heal, 20 health per second is absolutely it's oh sorry 40 per second Speaking the mana fight, is man, it's about to happen but navi it, i don't know if you if you realize the reason why they didn't want to go straight away both witch doctor ulti as well as last it was on cooldown for four seconds after that mid-tier one tower went down they needed an extra 10 seconds to initiate him while that tower was still up but they couldn't find the time for it really really good timing here from from c9 to make sure they get that objective and get a little bit of more pressure on the map so the thing about this game right now is that the map is pretty much open. Both teams have taken all the tier ones, but nothing more than that. So now it's about who gets the better vision and gets the pickoffs, because both teams have great pickoff mechanisms. They, Cloud9 have Io, of course, and uh, Navi with the Batrider. They just smoked on top of two Radiant Wards. That's not <laughs> gonna work. Um, what, what made it even worse was the fact that Klopp, like the second he saw that, threw the, threw the ulti out in the bottom wave, pushed it out, TP straight back to base again. So even if they do rotate down south, they won't find anybody. But they're coming mid. It's a five-man movement towards mid. Navi's out for blood. I don't think they're going to find any. Cloud9 knows exactly what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. Good vision here coming, coming out from Aoi in that mid lane. They're really putting a lot of emphasis on covering this area. If you notice, this ward is about to expire. And they place this one afterwards, which... They really know that... I think this is a wise way of playing against Navi as well. They put a lot of emphasis on the mid lane, pushing that one out and then branching out on the map. I would kind of call... You could call the mid lane a hub for Navi where they start out and then they find their, their openings across the map. Mm -hmm. So if you have vision in that area, it's often going to counter their smokes. And uh, we just see a good example of that here. And now Cloud9 are going to try to use their own. And if they get a pick off here, they they'd, might be able to get the T2 as well. Get in the trees. Prepare for Roche. They've got to get in the trees and quick before that smoke's going to break out. And now, double stun out Washikuro. He tried to throw over. They blink over to him. Bone 7, he's going to hold it. The flame break buys the space. And Dendi in for the big tornado. The quad body will go, but the deafening blast doing more work for Denny. And now Kuro from the other side of the tree line. He gets a double kill out with his ult. Even Pilot, I think, too close. Denny Elites will go down to the doom, as well as the Queen of Bane combination, while Funic managed to catch tree and protect her out from the side. And Wisp has to relocate out. He tried to bring in the rest of the team. There was three heroes smoked up. And only two heroes from C9 will survive. That Cl was such a sick initiation from Dendi. That was just perfect. The <laughs> crazy again, thing is too... four-man tornado. Yep. And then I think three people got hit by the Deafening Blast and the Meteor for full damage. Even the mech from Sing Sing as well as Scorched Earth and Living Armor. <laughs> they couldn't stay alive. And that's, you know, that's the thing about Living Armor. When you're playing against a lineup like, uh, like Navi's, they actually have quite a few ways of removing those instances of, uh, of damage blocking. Mm -hmm. Of course, the Firefly from Batrider, uh, the Meteor deals a lot of damage over instances as well. Um, I'm going to throw the Aghanim Scepter on Witch Doctor into that yep, pool as well. That's probably going to be a thing at some point he's, as well. He's but only 2,000 gold away from it, man. Oh, he, yeah, he is. Yep. Yeah, he is definitely building that. I'm, it could just be, you know, casual point booster, but I think in this game for Kuro, it's a really good choice. And again, yep. just well, what's really nice to see from Navi in this game is that they got really locked down early on. Um, like C9 were ahead by 7 to 0, but Navi played their timing window. Uh, it's just a very well executed mid game oriented strategy here where they got the towers they needed, they stayed in the game, they got Roshan, and now their lineup is just so incredibly strong around this 25 minute mark that we're approaching. They have everything they need. Juggernaut is one of the greatest carries at this point in the game. Uh, he falls off in super late game compared to many others, but just 
the whole the whole combination of heroes and the way Navi has played the last few fights has just been really beautiful to watch. C9 have to move quick. Kuro is actually giving the heal to a Vorse inside the pit. Denny will blink in with the Forge Spirits, and C9 is coming in. They're coming with the smoke. There's a Dire Sentry Ward here, but obviously that doesn't work with the smoke. There's actually two Dire Sentry Wards, and now they find Kuro. Doom will come off on Kuro. At the same time, Batrider Funny goes up, pulling, pulling Sing Sing inside the pit, and the Quad Party will fly out too. Owie's ulti too. The perfect blink and initiation from C9, catching Navi in the choke point. But again, Dendi with Tornado and Deafening Blast has caused all sorts of problems. And Funny, he's coming out for Envy. A quick toss in the air, and the relocate pulls him out in time. However, however Avorst in with a crit, bringing down the tree and Protector. And Funnick, he's in the corner. Unfortunately, he can't get himself out until the blink will finally go. But Sing Sing, following with his own blink, but the flame break pushes him up on the hill. And he just has to TP out very, very quickly before anyone can capitalize on it. And that's I why think Denny was blinking. Will in. be getting pie here. He has no one to tether to. Now there's the go ghost scepter. And now the tether time was bought. Oh, beautiful. Pilot, I played that fight so amazingly. So, this is a classic way for C9 to approach playing against Batrider. I think Pilot Eyes, I haven't really, I don't recall seeing anyone else doing this, at least not to the extent that he does it. So he makes these like 200 range relocates where the lasso is on Sing Sing and then he tethers in and relocates him still staying inside the fight. He's not pulling him out of the fight, he's just pulling him out of the bad position. Yep. And that was so well done here from, from Pilot Eye to really save that fight and get them a pretty even one. Problem is Navi still being dire, having that advantage and generally the way C9 had to retreat pretty much every hero they had in the end. Is still going to get Navi Roshan, but they did a really good job in that fight, not losing more. Uh, and Pilot Eye definitely, for me, playing a very, very good game so far in the IO. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a difficult game for you to play as well. When you got two heroes blink daggering around on you, like Poppy's got his own blink dagger. This is just how farmed up that SD like. This is the guy you were talking about saying, well, Puppy's only level two this, ma this far into the game. He's managed to buy up his uh, Bracer, Tranquils, Magic Wand, and, and have a Blink Dagger initiation on top of all of that. And then you've also got like Invoker four staffing people around with his own Blink Dagger. Sorry, it's actually three Blink Daggers over on Na'Vi. The maneuverability is just insane. At the same time, Aoi, his Blink Dagger, how much did that pay off? When he managed to get that full root on uh, Na'Vi, on the choke point inside the pit. That's something right then too, where you wonder just how effective the Kuro, how effective Kuro's Aghanims is going to be. Because BKB won't be able to allow him to get a full ulti off either. I think the, the thing for Kuro here is he's just going to need to stay far out of the fight because he doesn't, he doesn't need to be very close to the fight. His teammates can definitely buy some time between Juggernaut, having Disruption, having all the defensive abilities that Invoker has regardless Funnix of what in trouble. build he goes for. Now he, he's not committing with the haste rune, of course he can't. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to happen. Uh, bottom lane, however. Yeah, there goes your ulti out on Pilot Eye as well as Envy and Pilot Eye. He's got the choice to relocate him out of here, but he's not going to do it right now. The tether's going to be there and actually splits them up with the lasso back, dragging Envy away. Now the Doom will be cast over on Kuro, but there'll be some hold up time. And that's going to come through the disruption, but then with the big ulti from Quop, plus the ulti from Aoi, Avorst and Kuro find themselves in more problems. But Kuro, he's still taking through this. Finally, Quop will put him down with a scream, while level death under Avorst, keeping him low and Sing Sing. He's got four and three over the top of him, making a seven, making his death. Deafening Blast forcing him back and Na'Vi they're showing their power during these team fights yeah, Dendi wasn't even there <laughs> that's the scary point he came in at the end because when Na'Vi get this kind of an opening it's just I don't see C9 fighting back when Havost gets the the Omni Slash on Io and Tiny like he did there and Batrider gets the lasso off in my book, it's almost impossible for C9 to turn it around. And the problem is that the amount of AoE control they have is kind of restricted to overgrowth only. And like you said, how much is that really going to do here against Navi's lineup? They still have ways of breaking it. Havost has two ways of breaking it. He's got Omni Slash as well as Blade Fury. You've got the Witch Doctor who can just put down his Death Ward after he gets rooted and do the job. And then Dendi is so heavily spell-based that as long as he gets in position, which I doubt he won't with a four staff and blink, he won't really care too much about getting rooted either. So, oh, we're, we're reaching a point now going. Cloud9, I feel We're like going in for Koro. Avalanche and Toss have to be used, but now Juggernaut ulti will also be used. But Koro gets a malediction off. Pilot he has to go Scepter. 70 life points. He's bottling up and warding up as quickly as possible, but now he's got Eternal Envy stranded. Koro's throwing down the ulti. Shadow Demon will actually get the last hit in on Tiny. And the relocate was meant to be just a quick snipe off, but they ended up having the entire Na'Vi line up there to stop him. That wasn't the plan. That was not the plan. 
it's just so hard for them to find relocate ganks uh, again. They, they did so well early on with getting a couple of relocate ganks, but I don't think the biggest part of it was relocate. It was just smart movement. But now that the map has opened up as much as it is and Navi can just start taking these team fights together, you're st you start to wonder if this was the game plan C9 should have had from the start, or when they got a good start in the game, if they shouldn't just have gone really greedy, like gone for a Midas on the Owie, tiny maybe a Midas on Doom. The gem's going to drag him back. Sunstrike's almost in the perfect position. Now he stops for the ulti so he can try and TP out. That's but a gem lost as well. Yep. Which means now there's actually two gems over on Na'Vi. <laughs> yeah. Just I think to make Pop life harder. Puppy can take it back to base if he wants. He's going to give it to the courier. And yeah, generally the hero you want to have the gem on is, of course, Batrider. Because with Firefly, he can see all the... All the ward spots, of course, and he's also going to be the initiator in case they try to pull something with nature's guys from the Treant. I just, at this point, it just seems like Na'Vi is an unstoppable death ball. When they get into a teamfight together, it's hard to imagine how C9 are going to turn it around and get it off. They, they have to get a really good initiation with Doom, of course, with the Shiva's guard now on Sing Sing. If he can blink in and Doom Dendi before he gets abilities off, I think that's the key target. They have to prevent this combo from Dendi, which... If he isn't doomed, I think he's going to get it off every single time. They don't have any other ways of dealing They'll with him. They'll have a side device shortly on the corner. They, they don't have it yet. That's you're, tr you're right. He almost has a side. That will be really important. But oh, this Dendi. is what he's jumped in. Meteorite, deafening blast, pylite die has to receive the mech and the quad pulti. It was a little bit short from Bone Seven. That's 40 seconds on cooldown and funding. He managed to pick up Sing Sing. And you know what? Primary target relocate out to safety. Sing Sing is a little bit further back, but the concoction's actually causing some problems from Koro. And Dendi wall blinks in again. Level death came out on him. He has a little bit of bonus damage on that too, but Sing Sing, get your ass back off the Firefly. And Pylon Daiwei, he relocated him back into the fight and into the <laughs> Ice Wall again. <laughs> but at least they bought some time. Bone 7 will have another ulti up in 10 seconds or so. But Navi are definitely just trying to force up to the high ground. It's kind of crazy how confident they are. They have Lasso and Omni Slash on cooldown. They're still just pushing in here. Of course, they do have the Aegis on Dendi. Oh, oh, and he's wall. in a bad position here. And he can't be saved from this. He's just used his BKB. Now, Tree will come out. Avorce actually ends up wasting most of spin, but Puppy, he's in saving grace. Kuro throws the ulti down, but there's nothing to stun him up right now. All of the stuns have already been used here from C9. Dendi is, however, still going down on Bone 7. He's managed to at least pop the Aegis, but that's all Na'Vi have lost. Of course, they've used every single ultimate in their bag, but then again, so has C9. I think this is going to end up with Na'Vi getting Rex at this point. I, I don't know if C9 has what it takes to defend anymore. Of course, the Queen of Pain ulti is up in 10 seconds, but... But so is Juggernaut uh, ulti. Yeah, Juggernauts will be... Uh, Batrider has Lasso again. Yep. This is going to be a really difficult hold to make. They're trying to at least do some range harassment before they go in for the main shebang. And well, Envy, he can at least clean through the lane, but now we're going again. Lasso out, Owie blinks in for the lead. See the slow down Funnic, but Meteorite and Deafening Blast again from Denny and Sing Sing. So low on life, almost dead. Meg charge, one second was all that was left on that one. It would have really helped, but Avorce, he's already in deep. He's used the ulti. Pilot Eye, Ghost Scepter will save him for the moment, but C9 say no more. GG it out. 33 minutes into this game. And Na'Vi will take game number one here of the best of five grand final for the D2CL. Not a bad day's work for the first game. Not a bad no. day's work. Considering it looked like they were in real trouble at the start. Well, it was, it was nine for zero at one point. How often do you see teams winning a game in like half an hour when they're behind by nine zero? It's, it's just really really unusual here, and Na'Vi just played an inc incredible mid-game. I think C9 played a great game as well, and it's especially for me, Pylite I played a very good IO game, uh, which might be something Na'Vi want to take away from them, but when you just saw the execution of the fights and how they were initiated, it seemed like C9 were lacking in the mid-game in terms of their strategy, that they didn't have enough to take the fights. Queen of Pain going for an Ag Scepter is all great for pushing out the waves, but in terms of the raw team fight, that Ag's upgrade doesn't really give you the value for what it costs. You buy it for the cooldown reduction. If Bone 7 would have had an early Hex or an Orchid, maybe they could have done something with that instead. Yeah. Um, but he, he went for an item that, you know, th there was kind of a... For C9 strategy, it didn't make too much sense. Like, it seemed like they wanted to really focus on the mid-game. Mm -hmm. To me, Aghanim Scepter on Queen of Pain is not a mid-game item. It's one you get if you're focusing on the late game, because you keep pushing out the waves and you just farm. Yeah. And I think C9 could have done that. Go more greedy in this game. Get the Midas on Tiny, maybe on Doom, and just farm. Because their early game went so well that maybe Na'Vi couldn't have forced them into a position early enough to prevent all the farm from coming out. But then C9 kind of got into the situations on their own, because they wanted to push. And then they hit a wall when Na'Vi was just stronger than them, and then there was, like, no coming back. Yeah.
That that fight up on top lane for me was like that critical moment when you realized just how strong Navi was. Like that Dendi jump in, which then just brought up his Aghanims, just caused so many problems. And I, and I can I kind of understand too what Bone Seven was considering with this. It was meant to be flash farm. That's all the, the Aghanim scepter was meant to be. It was flash farm into Scythe of Vice. I just think they underestimated just how quickly Navi would come online. And when that happened, like then again, how can you underestimate that when you have when you have a blink dagger on bat riders norm normally coming up by at least a 10 minute mark they're going to come online decently early and sd is going to buy in that time to get there yeah at the end of the day though navi game number one belongs to them game number two will be coming up after this short break so stay tuned and we'll be back here to see if navi can take a two game advantage here or if cloud nine will kick back and t tie things up at one apiece we'll find out soon Bonk, 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 bonk